beings fear that which they do not understand. That is why we must be unknowable. Our mystery, as much as our strength, is what inspires fear in our enemies. A host of heroes. Every custodian is a small army unto himself. Clad in the finest armor and wielding the most powerful weapons, few can go toe to toe with any one of the ten thousand. When the custodies muster in number, immense forces indeed are needed to stand against the power of such a force, and the custodies' targets are all but doomed. Unlike the soldiers of the other branches of the imperial military, the warriors of the custodies commonly fight as individuals, rather than in cohesive units. The Adeptus Custodes are more akin to a warrior aristocracy than a hierarchical fighting force like the Astra Militarum or Adeptus Astartes. Custodians operate within a system of meritocracy that sees success and ability afforded great honor, regardless of an individual's experience. This does not bring them disadvantage. However, in battle, it makes every squad, known to the custodies as a sodality, a highly flexible unit they can be trusted to fulfill a role without overt command and control protocols being in place. Every custodian, from the newly ascended to the captain general himself, is possessed of great tactical acumen. With their preternatural reaction speeds, war gear, and physical strength combined, the custodies have defeated enemies many times their own number. Over the course of a custodian's genetically extended lifetime, he will accrue a number of honor names and titles. These are based on his glorious battlefield deeds, personal characteristics, life history, and the given role he currently holds. Many names are derived from those of tyrants and lords from Terran legend, all lend to a culture that harks back to a history deeper than any other imperial organization, which separates the custodies further from the rest of the Imperium, and ties them closer to the timeless nature of the Emperor. Most of these names are kept secret, though some myths circulate that they are etched upon the inside of a custodian's armor, or even microscopically onto their bones. Hundreds of symbolic or traditional titles are used within the Adeptus Custodes, such as Aquila Commander, Justice Supreme, or Emperor's Headsman. Some they keep for life, such as Shieldsmith, which is awarded to any custodian who has successfully won a blood game. Conversely, a custodian who has stood amongst the companions will forever be known as Honored Watchman. The custodian's organization is Byzantine and ancient, with much of its structure, disposition, and regulation kept secret. The custodian's ranks are stratified and highly complex, 
and much of the reason for this is to deliberately misdirect those who wish to learn more about how they operate. Though part of the reason is the slow evolution of the organization. Even the most senior imperial officials can only garner the barest scraps of information about how the custodies organize themselves. And that is only what the 10,000 use publicly when fighting alongside other imperial formations. The organization structure itself is unlike anything within the Imperium, with numerous overlapping orders and chambers. Many of these esoteric groups are as ceremonial in nature as they are indications of battlefield formations or functions. The Adeptus Custodes are led by the Captain General, who has absolute authority over the entire organization, and who speaks with the voice of the Emperor. He is advised by the Custodian Tribunate, ten veteran warriors who are among the keenest minds after the Captain General in the Ten Thousand. They must serve for at least ten years, though their memberships is rotated periodically to prevent complacency and to ensure fresh wisdom comes to the fore. To join the Tribunate, a custodian must have earned ten names and won three great victories. During their time of service, no member of the Tribunate takes to the battlefield unless in the most extreme circumstances. Their entire focus is supporting the Captain General in strategic and diplomatic matters. Most custodies belong to one of five broad orders. Though not battle formations, they are ceremonial groupings that date back millennia. The Haikanatoi order contains the main strength of the custodies and do not typically possess any obvious battlefield specialism. Alaris custodians and other heavy units that can function as shock troops are often a part of the Theranatoi order. A key function of the Adeptus custodies has always been speed. They once had to be ready to accompany the Emperor wherever he went, and they must remain capable of responding to new threats with incredible fury. Reconnaissance and the ability to counter-strike are cornerstone skills and tasks of the Custodes. And the Cataphractoi Order has been an instrumental part of that. Virtus Praetors mounted upon Dawn Eagle jet bikes often being among its members. The custodians have always behaved as a shadow force in the Imperium. The Ephoroi being exemplars of this. They have carried out missions of vital import to the Emperor's security for thousands of years. And their network of spies and contacts are enormous. Many custodies are involved in the process of carrying out covert missions on the Emperor's behalf, including counter-surveillance and assassination. The smallest order is the Mori Toy, the honored dead who walked these are the Adeptus Custodes Dreadnoughts, 
combat walkers with fallen custodies interred within. And they have much experience and wisdom. The shield captains are the most visible custodian leaders to those few who have ever fought beside the Ten Thousand. Warriors of supreme insight, tactical acumen, and knowledge, they lead military detachments. However, many shield captains boast additional titles that they have been assigned or are linked to other duties that they hold. These include Supreme Castellan, Master Guardian, Lord Protector, High Shieldsman, and a great many more. When a glorious host of custodies goes to war, it is a shield captain who takes charge, and he has enormous autonomy over which and how many warriors join his shield company. A shield company is a temporary formation of custodies brought together by a shield captain, as and when a force is required. There appears to be no regulation as to what form a shield company takes, how many warriors may be a part of it, or what orders or chambers they belong to. The shield captain is granted the autonomy to draw upon whichever warriors and whatever assets he feels are best suited for the task. A shield captain may draw upon significant numbers of Alar's Terminators if he believes he will have to fight in boarding actions, or Virtus Praetors if he expects to fight on vast open battlefields. He will also likely be joined by a number of senior warriors, such as blade champions, who act as the shield captain's companions and who can also lead forces in their own right. A shield captain may name the shield company he forms, such as the Gilded Talons, led by Arcturus Pallides, or the Auric Blade, led by Honorus Heliathon. Warriors may fight as a part of many shield companies during their lifetime, and a shield captain may reform the same shield company on multiple occasions when he is assigned a task by the Captain General. Alongside its custodian complement, the shield company is joined by a number of supporting assets, known as its Imperatus Auxilla. These include warships, vehicles, and dreadnoughts, as well as non-combatant agents. On occasion, a number of shield companies are brought together into what is known as a shield host. Collectively, the auxiliary units attached to such a formation are known as the Maximus Auxilla. Though in practice, each shield company fights with its own Imperatus Auxilla. Shield hosts are only formed in rare circumstances, to undertake certain tasks or in the face of the direst threats. Like shield companies, they are created on a temporary basis, with the potential to be reformed if so desired or ordered. The Solar Furies shield host was first assembled out of no fewer than five shield companies in M36. When a Necron tomb world awakened perilously close to Terra, 
and has been reformed many times since. A shield host can comprise two or more shield companies, and due to the very loose regimentation that the custodes armies work by, it is possible for any given shield host to be smaller than a large shield company. Whilst nominally shield hosts are temporary in nature, some have never been disbanded since their initial formation, a task for which they were founded having never concluded. Such permanent institutions include the Shadow Keepers, guarding the deepest vaults of the Imperial Palace. The Solar Watch, responsible for the borders of the Sol system. The Dread Host, who are the greatest bane of the Emperor's enemies. The Aquilin Shield, protecting some of the Imperium's most important heroes and the Emperor's messengers known as the Emissaries Imperatus. Others include the Technologors Noctis Cognis, who garrison the Ferrum Raptorus star keep in orbit around Mars, watching over the tech priests of the Red Planet and other Forge worlds. Meanwhile, the Vigilia Circumspectus, or the Watchers of the Watchers, are a shield host who keep a close eye on the Inquisition, an organization they see as a nest of potential dangers, and have been proven right on many terrible occasions. A shield host is commanded by the shield captains of all its shield companies, who on occasion fight together on the battlefield. The Golden Brothers, Heralds Three, and the Seven Shields are but three examples of groups of shield captains who have won renown throughout the Custodes' history. There is little conflict in shared command with shield captains openly divulging wisdom and insights, combining them with the shrewd advice of the veteran Vexilors, Custodes standard bearers. The Shadow Keepers There are terrible secrets locked away beneath the Emperor's palace. Eldritch terrors from the depths of the old night that could annihilate the Imperium. The duty of standing guard over them unto the end of time falls to the shield host known as the Shadow Keepers. The Shadow Keepers hold the keys to the rune-locked portals hidden deep beneath the Imperial Palace. They alone know the ways by which the runic locks may be disengaged, the wards unbound, and the sanctic circles breached. They alone know also that these things must never happen, for the dark cells hold such horrors that neither mankind's sanity nor its empire would survive their release. The Shadow Keepers are devoted to this grim responsibility, patrolling the dark and silent corridors and vigilantly watching over the last terrors of old night. It is a task that would soon drive most people mad, for though neither sight nor sound can escape the forbidden cells, the air of those corridors is charged with dread. A perpetual menace thickens the shadows, 
and makes them crawl. Even the superhumans of the Adeptus Custodes are forever on edge in those dark opulettes. For the sense of unspeakable threat never wanes. It is a testament to the discipline and spiritual fortitude of the shadow keepers that they stand there guarding unflinchingly, sometimes for decades at a time. If a custodian leaves the shadow keepers, those who knew them before they undertook such onerous duties can immediately see how the experience has affected them. They are more watchful, more ruthless, and less trusting. Few speak of what they've seen, heard, or done, and so few can relate to them that many return to the host that watches the dark cells. The ranks of this shield host include many custodian wardens, the endlessly patient watchmen whose oaths of protection help them focus upon the task at hand, to the exclusion of all else. The leaders of these forbidding centuries carry ancient weapons of mysterious provenance, their use intended as a last resort should anything ever break free from the dark cells. To be a custodian warden, a warrior must have served for at least five centuries. And, after a year of meditation upon the precipitous ledges of the Gallow Tower, must make a personal oath they have written themselves. Once accepted as a warden, they can be recognized by the ceremonial robes they wear over their armor, which marks their status. Every warden vows to never give way to any foe, and to be as unbreakable as the walls of the Imperial Palace. They are known amongst their comrades as level-headed and endlessly patient watchmen. To break their vows would be worse than death to these warriors, and their determination to uphold these promises bolsters their already formidable wills to something of truly frightening intensity. For 10,000 years, the Shadow Keepers have performed their duty. Yet, the coming of the Great Rift changed everything. With the power of chaos spilling raw and seething into the spaces between the stars, new abominations have come to light. Worse still are the cells that stand suddenly empty. The entities and artifacts once contained within, spirited away by some unholy force to curse the galaxy once more. Fearing the consequences of this, the Shadow Keepers have sent more warriors than ever before out into the galaxy. These jailers must trammel that which should not be slaughtering all who seek to impede them, before returning their foul prizes to the cells where they belong. The Aquilin Shield Certain servants of the Emperor bear great responsibilities deemed directly relevant to the safety of Terra. Such esteemed figures are afforded the protection of the Aquilin shield, at least until their usefulness is thought to be at an end. As
as the doom scryers of the Imperial Palace sift through the tides of the Empyrean for warnings of disaster. We also take note of those who, through example, thought, or deed, are likely to avert such catastrophes before they threaten the Golden Throne. These fated individuals are honored with the protection of the Aquiline Shield. In this way, even a small sodality of custodians can ensure a significant martial or spiritual asset survives to act in the Emperor's defense. The Aquiline Shield are an informal brotherhood laced through the ranks of the Adeptus Custodes. They typically operate in small warrior bands journeying across the stars to stand watch over their charges wherever they may be. No warning is given, nor permission asked. The warriors of the Aquiline Shield appear as if from nowhere, avatars of the Emperor's will, who announce their quarry to be under the protection of the master of mankind. Such is an honor beyond compare, and is rarely refused no matter the circumstances or the individual chosen. Those that have denied them have almost always ended up dead. Some suffer from a calamitous fall from grace, while the fate of many others is completely unknown. Custodians who have once served amongst the companions, those who personally protect the golden throne itself, commonly lend their talents to the grim bodyguards of the Aquiline Shield. Such custodians have protected the lives of the greatest and most august personages in the Imperium, most notably the High Lords of Terra themselves. From the Master of the Navigator's Guild to the High Logisticar of the Adeptus Administratum to the Lord Militant of the Imperium, and the shadowed master of the Officio Assassinorum. Former companions have acted as guardians for them all. To the Ten Thousand, such duties are simply an extension of their vows to protect the Emperor. In this case, by safeguarding those assets, most important to the successful running of his Imperium. Still, it is a role that has earned the Adeptus Custodes much favor in the eyes of Terra's noble elite. The Aquilin Shield has also acted as bodyguards to the Sororitas Canonesses, Lord Inquisitors, Astra Militarum Generals, space marine captains, and even two crusade leaders bearing the title of War Master. Staunchly ignoring the historic associations with he who first held the rank, the traitor Primarch, Horus. The custodies of the Aquiline Shield have appeared amidst flares of golden light to watch over firebrand frontline preachers, bewildered militia leaders, and others of apparently little import and anonymous, lowly origin. The only unifying factor amongst them is that while attending their duties beneath the gimlet gaze of the Emperor's own guards, these individuals are expected to achieve incredible things in the defense of the throne world.
though they themselves rarely have any idea of the true significance of their actions. The Aquiline Shield fight to ensure such a future comes to pass, guarding their charges from harm until the exact moment the usefulness of the person under their protection is deemed spent. At that point, they depart without a word, leaving those they guarded to look to their own defense. Tragedy often follows, but this is of no concern to the Aquiline Shield, provided it does not jeopardize the safety of the Golden Throne. One such action of the Aquiline Shield was the protection of Lieutenant Nathassian of the Cadian 86th. Slated for execution, he was spared when the grim-faced custodians appeared in a blaze of golden light and cut down his commissariat would-be executioners. Athassian was then free to exercise his flair for unconventional tactics, which soon saw his promotion to war master of an entire imperial crusade. The shuddering stars were swept clear of orc tribes, stopping Wad Daxgrag in his tracks before it could descend upon the Sol system. In the wake of Nathassian's triumph, the custodians departed as suddenly as they had arrived, and the commissariat saw Warmaster Nathassian dead before the day was out. The Aquiline Shield will not always act in small groups. On occasion, the custodians of this shield host must gather in greater numbers. Should the individual they seek to protect be surrounded by foes, they might have to fight their way to them. If the Doomscriers detect a future hero of Terra early enough, they might not even have been born. If their future birth world is under threat from Xenos invasion or controlled by heretics, then the Aquiline Shield will deploy to eliminate the danger so that the one they need to protect will actually come into existence. It is quite possible that these individuals will receive close protection from an Aquiline Shield sodality later in life also. The Dread Host Fear is a familiar weapon to the Imperium used to deter enemies and keep seething populations in line. Yet there is no terror as pure and absolute as that invoked when the Emperor's own fury is unleashed to punish his foes. The Dread Host represents a breathtaking concentration of military might. It numbers hundreds of custodians, organized into multiple shield hosts, and transported aboard a trio of pre-heresy warships, the Atropas, the Clotus, and the Lakesis, collectively known as the Morades. The nature of this army is simple. It is the deliverer of the Emperor's judgment, his anger, and his punishment made manifest. Not for them, the pinpoint rapid strike, the hidden war, or the measured defensive action. Instead, the assembled shield captains of the Dread Host identify the most visible and dramatic threats to the Segmentum Solar and unleash upon them such overwhelming annihilation 
that it sends shock waves rolling through the warp itself. Sometimes one warship is sent, sometimes two. Only a handful of times in the Imperium's history have all three of the Moradis loosed their passengers against a single foe. Yet always the effect is the same. Spearheaded by dozens of Alaris custodians, the dread host falls upon their victims with unstoppable force. They slaughter the enemy's warriors and reduce their war engines to wreckage. They cast down false idols and set them aflame. They topple their foes' cities, sunder their strongholds, butcher their allies, and decimate their followers. The dread host makes grisly examples of those who would dare lead such a challenge to the emperor's dominion. Accepting no surrender and foiling all bids at flight. By the time the dread host is finished, nothing remains of their luckless victims but the gruesome tales of their inevitable demise at the Emperor's hand. The dread host have smashed unruly orc wise obliterated rebellious star systems, and crushed defiant traitor crusades. They have fought against enemies thousands of times their number, and humbled them through strategy, speed, and strength. With every campaign, they spread the terror of the Emperor's wrath. The breathtaking bloodshed and absolute destruction they leave in their wake has dissuaded hundreds of uprisings and invasions before they could even begin. The expertly crafted suits of Terminator armor worn by Alaris custodians have a worth measured in worlds. They are driven by magnetomic generator shrines, articulated with Leonis class accutators, and made up of layers of oramite and adamantine. Despite the armor's enormous weight, the custodians within retains full mobility and speed. Alaris custodians are hand picked from the most belligerent of the Ten Thousand, and relish fighting in the most dangerous battles. Their killer instincts and wrath are honed to a fine point, though their aggression is fully leashed to their will. Wherever they strike, they cleave enemies in two, blow them apart with grenades, or stun them with salvos of projectiles that unleash bursts of electro-exorcist chaff. So aggressive and heroic are these warriors that when the situation demands, they have been known to splinter their units entirely to fight as lone figures. They then eliminate key targets and so anarchy before fresh Adeptus Custodes forces arrive to end the conflict. It is an effective tactic that has seen more than one heretic fortress fall from within. The Solar Watch The Sol system is amongst the most heavily fortified of mankind's stellar holdings. The Adeptus Custodes consider its worlds, star forts, and space lanes to be extensions of their master's palace, and ensure they are guarded accordingly. 
From the vast orbital fortresses of Luna to the cloud keeps of Jupiter and the deep space star forts of the halo belt, humanity maintains hundreds of strongholds throughout the Sol system. Billions of weapons point menacingly into the dark gulfs of space, ready to unleash spectacular devastation upon any foolish enough to threaten mankind's seat of power. Armored towers and gargoyle-festooned bastions loom over every approach sanctified against the foul machinations of the Emperor's many foes. Entire fleets of Imperial Navy ships prowl the space lanes, vigilant for the slightest threat. Yet perhaps the most formidable of all Terra's outer defensive measures are the custodians of the Solar Watch. Consisting of several shield companies, the Solar Watch swear binding oaths to keep guard over the outer bastions of the throne world. They see themselves as the first true line of defense for the Imperial Palace, and it is their duty to ensure that no external threat ever makes it as far as Terra. To this end, they constantly patrol routes between the worlds and void-born structures of the Sol system, ever vigilant for danger. Since the Battle of the Lion's Gate, Solar Watch have stepped up their activities. They have brought hundreds more agents working at auger stations and pilgrim sancti vetting docks into their employ. They have also added seven more stages to the process of gaining approval to approach Terra, extending it by years. The most significant change is their increased remit, which now extends to ensuring the security of the warp routes into Terra. This they do by monitoring and defending nearby systems with Mandeville points that link directly to the Sol system. One Solar Watch action in recent years was the destruction of Wa Zogstomp. The Greenskins had toppled the Iron Warrior's Citadel of Miseries after a grueling three-year siege. They grew massive and powerful on a diet of constant warfare and eluded powerful war engines. Before they could leave to attack more worlds, custodians of the Solar Watch materialized within the Greenskin's capital ship, planting vortex implosion detonators on each one before teleporting back to their own vessels. When the vortex bombs exploded, the entire orc fleet was consumed in a ferocious energy storm. Though they typically travel via naval craft and interstellar trade ships, the Solar Watch maintain a formidable concentration of venerable land raiders and are typically able to deploy forces that are predominantly, if not entirely, mechanized. This allows them to respond swiftly and with overwhelming force to any potentially threatening situation that may develop. While such dangers are not common within the Sol system, they are certainly not unheard of. 
the Solar Watch have been instrumental in bringing an end to demon-worshipping cults, inquisitorial coups, and subtle Xenos incursions on every world bar Mars. While their authority technically extends to the Red Planet, the Adeptus Custodes are wise enough to maintain cordial relations with the servants of the Omnissiah, and so travel to that world only occasionally. They keep their distance, expecting the tech priests of Mars to censor their own deviance. Nevertheless, the custodies know that Mars failed the test of loyalty once before, and may do so again. Call's work on the Primaris technology was a greater indication than any of what can be hidden away on the Red Planet. Emissaries Imperatus In the days of the Great Crusade, the Emperor often entrusted crucial messages or artifacts to be borne by his custodians to their destined recipients securely. It is a duty they still fulfill now, speaking with the authority of the Master of Mankind himself. Though the Emperor has long been confined to the Golden Throne, there are those amongst the ten thousand who claim to hear their master's voice during their meditations and to feel his hand guiding them. To their comrades, there is no implication of divine intervention in this, for the custodies have never viewed the emperor as a god. They merely see their liege's indomitable will at work, reaching out from his shattered frame to direct his praetorians on Terra. And wherever duty may demand they venture, as he did when he could still walk amongst them. Those who feel the emperor's guidance, the keenest become emissaries imperatus. They band together in like-minded groups, and through discussion and meditation, interpret what it is that the master of mankind wishes them to do. With the tacit approval of the captain general, they bear the emperor's words across the imperium to commanders who must hear them or occasionally unlock some ancient device from the palace vaults and bequeath it to whichever champion can wield it best. Their words have redirected entire crusades and seen threats intercepted and archaeotech riches won that might otherwise have passed the emperor's servants by. It was due to the insights of the emissaries and Paratus that the Adeptus Mechanicus Explorator Crusade fleet, Gamma Hades, was directed to Hing's world, so that they may prize the archaeotech treasures from the grasp of the orcs who dwelt there. It was they who gifted the captain of the Knights of Abhorrent's second company with the Axe Tempros, before he went to war against the Hrud infestation in the Ghoul Stars. It was they that Captain General Trajan Valoris trusted to reach out to the scattered enclaves of the Sisters of Silence. He called them back in secret even before Gilliman openly declared that the Sisters be reincorporated officially into the Imperium's military. For thousands of years, the emissaries in Paratus have been seen abroad, but rarely and in small numbers. Yet, 
with the return of Gilliman and the commencement of the Indominus Crusade, their activity has increased considerably. When the Primarch announced his intentions to bear the secrets of the Primaris Space Marines to the Loyalist chapters, there was some resistance from the Adeptus Custodes, who feared strengthening those who might one day rebel against the master of mankind. Dozens of emissaries and Baratus stepped forward to intercede, stating that this was the will of the Emperor. They accompanied Gilliman's crusade, many of them taking to the air as Virtus Praetors. The quicker to deliver messages of reinforcement to the embattled space marines. The presence of the Adeptus Custodes also ensured that even the most traditional of chapters accepted the Primaris warriors into their ranks. One does not decline a gift from the Emperor's own hand, after all. Squads of Virtus Praetors swoop into battle astride powerful Dawn Eagle jet bikes. These veteran custodies know that the true value of speed comes from directing their might precisely where and when it is needed most. Virtus Praetors strike like golden lightning to bolster their comrades wherever they are hardest pressed. These airborne warriors act as the eyes and ears of their shield companies, soaring over the battlefield and voxing word of the enemy's movements. Their auto senses are optimized for this task. Boasting suites of data augers, optical auspicators, and multispectral motion oracles that allow them to detect and track even hidden foes. With a squadron of sharp eyed Veritas Praetors circling overhead, Custodes' forces are rarely caught unawares. Each Virtus Praetor is a master combatant. They are expert marksmen, able to place perfect kill shots even while moving at breakneck pace through dense terrain. Their close quarter combat prowess is no less exceptional. A Virtus Praetor can open the throat of a heavily armored foe in a single pass. They can also analyze even the most chaotic conflict in a heartbeat, reacting with incredible speed to evade obstacles and seize tactical opportunities. The exceptional skill of the Virtus Praetors is augmented by their superlative war gear, such as the enormous interceptor lances that they wield. Perfectly weighted, these fearsome weapons boast adamantine blades wreathed in disruptor fields. Virtus Praetors are masters of hit-and-run strikes, driving their lances clean through their precisely chosen targets before ripping them clear again as they speed past. The greatest asset at the Virtus Praetors' disposal are their Dawn Eagle jet bikes. These are incredible Crusade-era vehicles wrought in oramite and adamantine. They are almost as large as a light fighter craft, and while they are still grav skimmers, can deliver a near supersonic turn of speed. Their hulls are phenomenally durable, allowing their riders to slam through walls and enemy warriors without being unseated. And they react pugnaciously 
to the slightest touch of the controls, jinking effortlessly through incoming fire. When armed with hurricane bolters, the Dawn Eagle can plow bloody furrows through enemy hordes. When equipped with salvo launchers, they become lightning-fast tank hunters. Screaming across the battlefield, Virtus Praetors on Dawn Eagle jet bikes rapidly outflank and encircle the heaviest enemy vehicles before annihilating them with Melta missiles. Even the foe's aircraft are not safe, for by combining their fire, the Virtus Praetors are able to weave airborne webs of flak blasts into which hurtling enemy aircraft slam with terminal results. Silent Vigils After Rabute Gilliman declared the Dispensatus Anathema, the disparate Sisters of Silence scattered all over the Imperium were made a crucial element of its armed forces. One of the greatest changes of all was the establishment of the vigils, the way by which the Silent Sisters were united and organized in this new era. Those Sisters of Silence who fought alongside Rabute Gilliman during the Battle of Luna went out in search of others of their fragmented diaspora and the returned Primarch's instructions. Gilliman knew that the wars ahead would require every weapon humanity could bring to bear, and the sisters' talents would be vital to stymieing the powers of the warp. Many thousands came to Terra. These, Gilliman declared the Vigil Indominus. This was the first step on the way to a re-establishment of the Silent Sisterhood within the Imperium. Each band of sisters that came to Terra had its own tactics, character, and traditions, formulated over 10,000 years of adapting in isolation to the grim horrors of a galaxy riven by the heresy. The various groups became cadres of the Vigil Indominus, subunits of the Vigil Entire. The Vigil Indominus was much larger than the initial number that came to Terra. Many of the groups that had made it through were but representatives of a larger organization dispatched to answer the call. Very few entirely abandoned their self-imposed duties and crusades elsewhere in the Imperium. Most of the Vigil and Dominus's cadres adopted the gold and red of the Adeptus Custodes in honor of the respect afforded them by the Ten Thousand. Some, however, were headstrong and did not though most incorporated the colors into their cadres in some way as a form of recognition. As the fleets of the Indominus Crusade reached out into the galaxy, more and more enclaves of Silent Sisters were discovered. Some were not found for years after the Crusade was launched, but all were formed into vigils and cadres, and regions of jurisdiction were given to many. There was no uniformity to the range of a vigil's area of supervision. Some watched over a single system, others an entire sector. The creation of a vigil was often little more than a cosmetic affair. A discovered group 
would be named a vigil or cadre of a vigil and given official jurisdiction over the area it had been operating in for thousands of years. Naturally, some of these groups were larger than others and so commanded greater territory. Much of the real organizational work went into removing areas of overlap and ensuring every imperial world was within the purview of one vigil or another. Though much of this was done amicably, disagreements arose as some vigils saw valuable recruiting grounds handed over to others or felt that their resources would be greatly overstretched when given more territory. Other areas of difficulty were faced when small groups were expected to merge by Sister Commander Asurma in order to create a vigil of more effective size, or when especially remote enclaves of sisters were redeployed where their talents could be put to greater use. Much friction was created in this way, though the sisters' commitment to duty, as well as the prospect of being more openly accepted by the Imperium, prevented most from coming to blows. Each vigil has great autonomy, answering only to the High Lords of Terra themselves. They are named most frequently for the area of space they are responsible for, or the world they are based on, such as the Vigil of Darius III, the Segrites Nebula Vigil, and the Reductus Sector Vigil. The martial strength of a vigil varies, with some comprising many thousands of sisters. As with the vigil Indominus, each new vigil broke down its strength into cadres, where it had had the numbers to do so. Some cadres have adapted the color scheme of their vigil, using the same colors in different combinations as they too develop their own identity and traditions, while others remain true to their origins. Most are also given unique designations, with some mixing coded meanings common to the Silent Sisterhood, and others remaining specific to their vigil. Many of these identities are totemic, even feral in their nature, such as the bone tigers of the outer solar vigil and the steel drakes of the reductus sector vigil. Cadres have access to all the resources of their vigil, and though most can and do perform all the duties of the Sisters of Silence, some become specialized in particular tasks, investigating non-compliance with the Great Tithe, hunting fleeing psychers, or monitoring specific regions of space. Most vigils operate out of a fortified keep known as a spire convent. No two spire convents are identical and differ in form and layout according to the size, history, needs, and preferences of the vigil that uses them. The spire convent of the vigil of Orshan's belt is built into the former mountain lair of an orc chieftain slaughtered during the Horus heresy. The vigil of Hravulan have adopted a city-sized mining rig that roves slowly across their home world on sets of tracks bigger than super-heavy tanks. 
The Stragathin Seven Vigil Spire Convent is hidden beneath the ground, its corridors a cave network. The only sign of its presence is a ruined monastery sat atop a hillside, long forgotten by the barbaric native population. Though many vigils have a spire convent and a world they might consider their base of operations, at any one time many of their sisters are on the move, whether they are hunting, carrying out investigations, seconded to the black ships, or monitoring trade routes. With their order restored to a place of importance in the Imperium, it has become much easier for the Sisters of Silence to recruit and expand their numbers. Virtually every vigil is growing. The Great Tithe is one source, as the many people of many worlds cannot tell the difference between the powers of a blank and those of a psyker. Every sister is expected by her superiors to be on the lookout for potential recruits in conducting missions. And in this era of growth, it is a duty gladly undertaken by many. Some silent sisters even seek out pariahs who cannot join the silent sisterhood for reasons such as ailment. Such individuals are still dangerous in the hands of an enemy, and can serve instead as Kulexis assassins or soul guardians in the Emperor's palace. The Sisters of Silence receive many recruits from Inquisitors, and it is rumored that the Sisterhood secretly guard certain bloodlines and are husbanding many more of these than ever before. Stories explain that the Silent Sisters are doing this to maintain a guaranteed source of recruits, independent of any other Imperial branch. Some even speak of selective breeding, to in some way maximize the likelihood of blanks of a certain level of potency being born, if such a thing is even possible. Any recruits to the Silent Sisterhood face enormously arduous training. They must master warrior skills, as well as learning how to project or suppress the auras of their abilities. Many die in the process.